Uh, thanks everyone for coming back and for part two. And uh, this talk is going to be, um, uh, you know, sort of about my own research primarily. And in particular, uh, a 2009 um, paper that appeared in Econometrica called Search Obfuscation and Price Elasticities on the Internet. Okay. Um, let me just say a couple words about this is, uh, I should say this is co-authored with uh, Glenn Allison as well. And let me say a couple of words about sort of our broader um, research agenda. So in th this actually was touched upon in a couple of questions in the last talk. Um, there, there's been a little bit of, well, when, when um, commerce on the internet first uh, emerged, 15 years ago or more than 15 years ago, 20 years ago or so, um, there was sort of a lot of uh, excitement, especially in the popular press, that now that price search was so easy and so cheap that it would be ubiquitous and that we would be entering a new era of marginal cost pricing. Um, prices would just go down, every, you know, consumers, um, with little knowledge about prices could no longer be exploited because price search was so cheap and easy. And um, the early researchers, uh, Bay and Morgan and Scholten among them, but you know, sort of a whole series of others, uh, found that, found very mixed evidence on this. Uh, so there were some, um, there were some markets where prices did seem to be uh, lower online than they were offline, or seemed to be decreasing online over time as more consumers were searching. Um, but there were lots of markets online where this wasn't true. And so uh, one of the sort of broader research goals that Glenn and I have had is to try to um, uncover kind of unexpected explanations for why uh, the internet has not resulted in really low retail prices as you know sort of some of the popular press was predicting in you know the year 2000 or so and uh, this is one of the papers in that uh, in that sort of um, line of research another one that I mentioned in response to a um, question of John's uh, that I'm not going to talk about today is on uh, used books on the internet. And I'll just give you sort of a very quick um, overview of what we find in that paper. So used books was sort of an interesting, um, an interesting market because for two reasons. One is um, we thought that there was a potential that this market could be utterly transformed when it moved from a brick and mortar a based market to online. And why was this? Um, because not only could consumers very easily compare prices uh, for a particular title that they were looking for, but they could actually find the book. <laughs> uh, you know, I, most of you guys are too young, but you know, when I was younger, before you could buy used books on the internet, you'd go into a used bookstore, and if you had a specific title in mind, good luck. You know, maybe if it was a Tom Clancy novel or something like that, you'd get sort of an old paperback copy of it. But if you wanted anything unusual or niche, forget it. It was just, uh, you know, it was just sort of a fool's errand to look for it in a used bookstore. And so basically, there were a lot of people out there who wanted out of print books and were willing to pay a lot for them. And there were a lot of those out of print books sitting collecting dust on the shelves of used bookstores and those matches were never consummated because the used book was in a um, sh sitting on a shelf in a bookstore in Bakersfield California it was not sitting on a shelf in the used bookstore in my neighborhood okay and so we thought um, that that the internet had sort of a uh, the potential to really transform this market. And, you know, in fact, we found that it has. Um, because now, with the sort of <coughs> inventories of many used book dealers online, um, you can just go to uh, A Books or A Libris or Book Finder, or now, in fact, Amazon, I mean, for the past several years, has had, has incorporated the, the uh, um, inventory of A Books into their own website when they purchased it. Uh, you type in a title of a book and you're given a sort of a price sorted list of all of the vendors who want to sell it to you. 
And um, so, so we were very interested in studying this market. We gathered data both on, you know, off you know, brick and mortar stores and online, and we found something that given the sort of explanation I just told you might not be too surprising, but it was quite, um, it hadn't been documented before. We found that not only did prices not go down when used books moved online, they went up. They went sometimes very significantly up. And so this is, you know, sort of a, a, bit, of, um, a bit of a puzzle from the perspective that now there was a lot of competition, you know, sort of the, uh, the mo you know, the little used bookstore in the corner had some kind of uh, locational monopoly power. Um, and now he lost that monopoly power when he started uh, listing his titles online, his inventory online. But on the other hand, or lost much of the monopoly power. But then on the other hand, these high value matches between people looking for a particular title and the, that title sitting on a shelf, those high value matches were being made. And so then it becomes this sort of empirical question, um, what's going to happen to price? And we, we sort of have, you know, we have this in um, uh, um, a working paper right now uh, and um, you know, sort of not only document what happened to prices, but write down sort of a theoretical model that explains uh, this sort of match that incorporates both the match quality effect and the competition effect, and sort of give, gives rise to predictions that we see. Okay, so that's sort of one uh, one paper in this um, in this sort of um, agenda that Glenn and I have of like sort of asking uh, what are the effects sometimes unexpected effects of um, when, when markets move online and when price search becomes easier. And this is sort of, uh, I guess in some sense, the companion piece to this. The used book story is sort of a, um, a story where welfare is enhanced and all parties are uh, better off, even though prices have gone up because these high quality matches are being consummated. And this story has sort of a, a different welfare implications that I'm going to tell today. But it's another story of unexpected effects of, of um, uh, price search becoming very uh, easy. Okay? So, as I said before, uh, this talk is uh, based mostly on uh, this uh, sort of 2009 paper. And Glenn also has. Um, a paper model of add-on pricing, which is uh, relevant as well. Okay, so what was our motivation? Well, I've already given you some motivation, but we wanted to know how retailers responded to the advent of low-cost price search. So as we observed in the first lecture, um, you know, if if uh, retailers or if sellers are operating in a market with positive search costs, then they can, you know, sort of depending on the assumptions, they can often charge above marginal cost. They can sort of escape the Bertrand paradox. And so then that sort of poses that, that um, suggests the following question that, um, you know, are they going to engage in activities that can actually increase uh, search costs? Are they going to do things that are going to make search costs um, higher? Um, and our, you know, sort of our observation in this market is that th this could, we could think of this almost as sort of a balance of power kind of argument or a balance of power kind of situation where, you know, the, the consumers have a much higher quality search technologies at their disposal, but then the firms at the same time are going to use internet technologies much more effectively to thwart price search than they could have in the brick and mortar setting. Okay? And I should also say we're going to what we're going to see today is evidence of sort of an add-on pricing strategy which uh, shares a lot of uh, similarities with sort of a loss leader or bait and switch kind of techniques. It's not exactly the same, but it shares a lot of, uh, there's a lot of commonalities between them. And these are sort of techniques that have been used for decades, if not centuries, if not millennia, by retailers. Um, but, but one thing that this paper does is actually give sort of systematic evidence uh, that 
not just descriptive evidence, but systematic evidence of how these strategies work. And that's quite um, unusual. We were surprised. We figured these things had been studied exhaustively in the marketing literature. There's very, very little systematic evidence in the marketing literature of how these sort of pricing strategies work. And so that's uh, another thing that we do in this paper, another thing we provide. OK? Um, OK, so let me talk a little bit about the empirical setting. So we have data from a price search engine called PriceWatch, okay? And price, what PriceWatch did is it sold computer components online, or I should say it listed vendors who sold computer components online. Um, our data come from, you know, sort of again, sort of a pretty early period in internet commerce. The market has changed since uh, the, the, the uh, time when we collected the data, although PriceWatch still exists and some of the firms that we study still exist. Um, but the, the PriceWatch was basically a clearinghouse, uh, so not affiliated with any of the vendors selling the uh, computer components, but a clearinghouse that listed um, uh, vendors who wanted to sell computer components over the internet. So here, you know, I've, uh, I don't even know what these things are. I know what the mouse is. Okay, so they, <laughs> I know what the monitor is. This is, a, I guess this is a memory module. Yeah. Yeah. So ba basically this was catering to uh, um, a, uh, a clientele who was probably pretty savvy, pretty internet savvy. Uh, they had computers. They were uh, upgrading their own computers, so more savvy than I am, for instance, uh, in some ways. And... Um, Price watch, so you could go to Price Watch. You could uh, go to a particular category that you were interested in purchasing, and it would uh, give you sort of a price sorted list of the vendors who are willing to sell those products to you. So let me give you a little more detail. Um, yep, that's the product we're studying: memory modules. Okay, and we do have we gather data on some other products as well, but I'll, I'll just focus today on uh, memory modules. And so let's say I was interested in 128 megabyte PC100 memory modules. So as I said, this was a while ago. We collected the data. And um, what I would do is I could go to that category on PriceWatch, and this is what PriceWatch would give me. So it would give me a list of, uh, these are just sort of product, you know, bare bones product descriptions. It would give me a list of the vendors who were willing to sell me this product. And the default was that the price, um, it would be sorted by price, but then the shipping, which at this time price watch limited to $11, I believe, uh, the shipping would be listed right next to the price. So you could uh, pretty easily compute the inclusive, the shipping inclusive price. But the default was that it was sorted by price, okay? So I could sort of look at this page, and in fact, I could page down, and there were many more pages like this. Probably most people didn't page very far, right, because it's price sorted. So maybe they, they mostly looked on the first page, maybe a little bit on the second page. But I could sort of, um, you know, peruse this and decide which one of these vendors looked good to me. And let's say I decided I liked Portatech. So I could click through to Portatech, okay? And then that would uh, take me, uh, price, I would leave PriceWatch, and it would take me to the Portatech website. Now, PriceWatch was quite um, vigilant about making sure that the prices advertised were available on the website when you clicked through. Um, they were, um, you know, they, they, they uh, were pretty successful in doing that in our observation. Uh, so at least those kinds of uh, shenanigans, like a pure bait and switch, would have been you know, sort of very difficult in this market. Um, but, uh, and, and as I said before, that um, I guess this was in response to one of Kuhn's questions, uh, there had been, before we collected the data, a lot of shenanigans with shipping prices. And so because PriceWatch has an incentive to provide useful information to consumers or else they won't go, uh, they decided we're going to get rid of the shipping shenanigans and uh, say that shipping has to be limited to $11, no more than $11, okay? And so, um, uh, yeah, so anyhow, this is the, the information you had. You would click through to a particular website and, and um, 
then you would uh, you could make your purchase. Okay, so let's say I click through to the Portatech website, <coughs> and uh, this this actually is for not for exactly the same product on the Portatech website, but this gives you basic idea. And what Portatech is going to tell me is they're going to say, yeah, this was the this was the product we advertised, but you know. Honestly, and we'll sell it to you, but you know, honestly, it's a piece of crap. And you know, do you really want CAS3 latency? We can give you CAS2.5 latency. I don't know what that means. Maybe I'm intimidated <laughs> and I think, oh gosh, latency, that sounds really important. Okay, fine. Um, but you know, I mean, I know what some of these things mean you know, return shipping not paid, a nine month warranty, et cetera. Um, but you know, some of these things I may not even know what they mean. I may think, oh gosh, you know, these could be important or they might not be important or whatever. But Portatech says, fine, you know, what we'll do, we know that you want a 128 megabyte PC100 memory module. We'll sell you this piece of crap for, uh, I don't know what the price was here, $69 or whatever. But for an extra $15, we're going to give you a much better product. Okay? And Look at all of these dimensions on which uh, qu quality can be defined. Okay, so it's complicated. It's complicated to say what a medium quality product in this market is. Okay, or hey, for an extra twenty-five dollars, we'll give you this one. And you know, you don't have to put up with this crummy aluminum heatsink. We'll give you a copper heatsink. Okay, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, some of these things, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this market. Some of these things might be important. Some of the people buying these uh, memory modules might not know whether they're important, but think they might be important. But in any case, Portatech is going to give me this option to, um, to uh, uh, upgrade to a medium or a high quality product. And basically, all of the vendors during this time were doing this. Okay, so they were advertising the low quality product and they were selling it. They had it in stock, they sold it. If that's what you wanted to buy, they would sell it to you. But if you, uh, for an extra $15, you could just, you know, you could get a much better product. And for 25, we can give you the gold standard, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the copper standard in this case, yeah. So. So let's think about this for a second. What could be the equilibrium effects of this kind of strategy? So if you're going to offer sort of the, the bare bones, lowest quality product, then price search is really easy across different firms for that. But every firm is probably going to offer a somewhat different medium quality product. Like there are all of these dimensions and there might be some things that some firms offer and other firms don't offer. Maybe there are other characteristics of quality that aren't even on this website, but I might find it on, on a different website. And so if you think about trying to design, if you're price watch and you're trying to design a website where a person who wants to buy a memory module but not a piece of crap memory module, a sort of medium quality one, can do an effective search for price, how do you even do that, right? There's just too, I mean, too many dimensions of quality and in fact, firms can just keep inventing new dimensions of quality. Like uh, you can't, you, th it's not a well-defined object to say, I want a memory module of medium quality and give me the best price for that medium quality memory module. This, again, this gets back to my former question. Isn't that exactly what Amazon did within a year or two? So Amazon, basically gave you almost all the return stuff and so forth automatically in Amazon Prime. You know, like you can return it, whatever. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no junk about that with very strong mm -hmm. warranties. And then they give you information so that people, they, they actually rated comments. So people would sort of say, if you need a medium quality, this is the best medium quality. Mm -hmm. and that happens like within a year or two of this. So, I mean, so Amazon did do some of that, but there's n absolutely no sense in which Amazon entered and this type of upselling disappeared. Just, you know, it's, it's still ubiquitous. This particular market that we studied uh, definitely has changed over time. But yeah, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. As I said, for millennia, <laughs> you know, we've seen these kinds of strategies. The, the other point I want to make about 
uh, this kind of upselling strategy or add-on pricing, as we called it in the paper, is that, um, you know, and I made this point just a minute ago, this kind of thing has been done by retailers forever, okay? But it was super expensive before the internet. So think about going to buy a mattress. So this actually happened to me. I went to, I, I, my family was coming to visit and I didn't have enough beds for everyone to sleep on. And I just, I had just moved into this uh, new house and I just wanted like the world's cheapest mattress for like a couple of people to sleep on. You know, they were gonna be there for a week, right? So I open up the Boston Globe and I look at an advertisement for mattresses. And the, I find a mattress for $29. I'm like, what? Really? Okay, fine. I'm going to the store. I know that the law says they have to sell me a mattress at $29, so I'm going to go. So anyhow, I go to the store, and this very well-dressed salesman, you know, welcomes me to the store. I say I'm interested in the $29 mattress, and he says, well, of course we have the $29 mattress, but you realize if you actually sleep on it, you could permanently destroy your back. <laughs> <laughs> and he sort of goes into this whole spiel, like you, and I said, you know, it's, we're only using it for a week, it's like not a big deal. You would really subject your guests to <laughs> the use of this inferior, and I said, yeah, they're my family, I don't mind, you know, I just want the cheap mattress. And anyhow, he goes through this whole, I mean, it took probably 20 minutes for me to talk him into selling me the, the low, <laughs> The, the cheap mattress. And he eventually did, because he had to. Um, but the point is that that salesmanship effort was extremely expensive. It took up 20 minutes of his time. He had to be really well trained to do it. Uh, the, the store probably thought he had to be well dressed to be convincing. He had to be <laughs> articulate. You know, it was, that's a really expensive thing to do. And here on the internet, these firms have basically reproduced that with just a website design. Okay, so this is what I talk. This is what I'm referring to when I talk about this sort of balance of power. Price search has gotten a lot, a lot cheaper and easier, but obfuscation has also gotten a lot cheaper and easier. Okay. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the data and then sort of our empirical results, and, and we'll sort of interpret them in light of uh, these um, our discussion. Okay. So what we did is um, we had. Um, connection to one of the firms who operated in this market. And that firm was willing to give us basically all of their data. Gave us all of their sales data, gave us all of their very detailed cost data, so we knew exactly what their wholesale acquisition cost of every single product was. We, knew, we know what their shipping costs were. We know we had their, their transaction by transaction data. You know, the, the, the um, you know, sort of uh, detailed uh, customer level data on every transaction, okay? So it's a wealth of information. Much of it we don't actually need to use here, but we have it. And then, but we wanted to study price search. And so what we needed to do is, uh, supplement that data that we were given by this one firm with the pricing data of all of their competitors. So all of the other firms that were listing on PriceWatch. So what we did is we scraped data hourly from PriceWatch for an entire year. Turns out that's a lot of, lot of data. <laughs> you know, you have hourly data on uh, a number of different products, although I'll just mostly talk about one today. Um, and we got the 20, we got the first two pages of price watch results so the lowest 24 prices every hour for an entire year okay and um, then uh, using both of these data sources combining them we we sort of created the data set for our analysis okay and for this paper uh, we actually didn't use uh, the the we didn't exploit the fact that we collected it hourly we aggregated up to the day level I have another paper on price stickiness where we actually use the hourly data um, but this for this paper we just aggregate up to the day level okay so uh, a couple of uh, variables I want to point out uh, the this P low rank variable 
is the rank of the low quality module on the Price Watch website. So I go to the Price Watch website. So remember, we have data from one particular firm. Okay. So I go to the Price Watch website and um, I get the price sorted list of vendors who are willing to sell this 128 megabyte PC100 memory module. And the rank of the firm that we have data from is what we call a P low rank. Okay? So the medium, I, sh I, I should also emphasize that this is, the pr this is the rank of the low quality product that this firm offers. It also offers a medium quality, it also offers a high quality as we saw before. Those are also on the price watch lists, but in fact they're significantly higher priced. So I would have to pay, we would have to page down several pages to get to get to see what their ranks were. Okay? And in fact their ranks aren't important because no one ever pages down to the seventh page anyhow. Okay? So they're they're listed there, but um, you know, basically no no customers ever see those listings. You would basically never go beyond the first or second page. Okay. So what we do is we have the rank of the low quality product and then we also, and that's basically, you can think of that as what the website uses to advertise itself and to draw customers in. Okay, So they're going to price uh, their low quality product in such a way that they're going to get some consumers to click on them from the PriceWatch website. I should also say that almost all of the sales to these firms during this time came through PriceWatch. Okay, so this, this PriceWatch portal was very important. Okay, um, so you, you price your low quality product in such a way that you get some consumers to click through to your website, then once, you're at their webs once they're at your website, then you try to talk them into upgrading, okay? Or you just sell them the low quality product they came for. Okay, so you can think of this P low rank as being kind of uh, an advertisement for the website. That's a, one of the purposes it serves. Okay, and so then we had, uh, we collected the prices of the low quality, medium quality, and high quality products, um, memory modules uh, for every day. And then also the average daily quantity sold of the three quality levels. Okay, and so you can see the, the difference between the low quality and the medium quality on average is, is something like $25 and then uh, you know it looks like a $35 increment between the medium and the high quality. Um, and you can see the, the um, quantities that were sold by the website in the three different quality levels. The low quality quantity uh, is, is uh, sort of dominates their sales, right? So almost everyone who comes to their website it, you know, isn't a sucker. Okay, They're, you know, they don't say, ah, oh, you know, a copper heat sink. They say, oh, no, I search for the, the low quality product. You're not going to get me to upgrade. I'm, I'm getting the low quality product. So that's where most of their sales come from. Uh, we'll see that's not where most of their profits come from, but it is where most of their sales come from. And then, but there is, there are substantial sales to the medium and the high quality products. Okay. Okay. So now recall the objectives. So think back to what sort of motivated the study and what we would like to try to find in the uh, sort of empirical analysis. So we want, first of all, we want evidence that this uh, firm was engaging in some kind of obfuscation, was making price search more difficult. We want evidence that the obfuscation techniques are effective uh, in getting some, custo uh, some customers seeking the low quality modules to upgrade. Okay, so we want evidence that people are clicking through to the website and some fraction of them are upgrading. Okay, we also want evidence that firms are benefiting from this obfuscation. Okay, there's no reason for them to do it if what is happening is that they use the low quality product price as an advertisement and they keep lowering it, lowering it to get more click throughs and lower it, lowering it so far below marginal cost that they're losing money on that and then you know sort of breaking even with the the fraction of upgrades that they sell okay so that's one story you could tell but then there'd be no reason for the firms to engage in uh, this obfuscation activity okay if they if on average they were just marginal cost pricing 
And so we'd like to have evidence that, in fact, uh, they are benefiting from this technique. Okay? And we'll, I'll discuss this later. Uh, adverse selection is going to be the key to them benefiting. When they lower their price of the low quality product, they get a worse mix of customers clicking through. Okay? If they're sort of the lowest price guy on the price watch list, they get a bunch of cheapskates clicking through and saying there's no way I'm going to upgrade. If they raise their price a little bit on the low quality, then they get a better mix of customers. And that's going to be the key for this obfuscation strategy to be profitable for them. Okay, so we're first going to just look at uh, estimated demand. And let me point out what these things are. So we estimate demand for uh, the low quality modules, for the medium quality, and the high quality. Okay? And uh, in all cases, we're going to estimate these as a function of the rank of the low priced um, product. Now, why should that matter to the sales, the demand for the medium and the high quality? Well, if you think of this as sort of a, an advertising tool to get people to click through to your website, then this uh, estimated coefficient is going to tell us something about how, uh, how effective it is uh, in, getting, in generating sales for the low quality, but also uh, these two will tell us about how effective this advertising tool is in generating sales for the medium and high quality. I'll go through this in more detail in a second. Okay, so uh, this so one of the explanatory variables is this sort of uh, rank of the low quality product. Then we're also going to include price of the low quality, price of medium, and price of high to estimate price effects, obviously, in the demand equation. Uh, and then we have some other controls. Okay, so the first thing um, to point out is that sales of all the qualities uh, are sensitive to the rank of the low quality module. Okay? So basically you can change the price of your low quality module and you can you can increase it or decrease it keeping the prices of medium and high quality modules constant. And if you lower the price of the low quality, that increases your sales of the medium and high quality. And uh, conversely, if you raise the price of the low quality, it lowers your sales of not just the low quality, but also the medium and high quality. Okay? So right there, this tells us that this, that sort of using the low quality price to get, um, to get people, customers onto your website, some of whom you can convince to upgrade, is, is effective. Okay? That's what these estimates tell us. Okay. Now, we also estimate separately price effects for the low, the medium, and the high quality. Uh, the rank of the low quality and the price of the low quality are obviously very highly correlated, so we don't do, we, we can't uh, do a great job of separately estimating those two coefficients, although they are both uh, negative, as you would expect. Um, and then there are significant uh, price effects for the medium and the high quality um, modules as well. Okay. Okay. So now what we can do is when when do we go into? Sorry. You still have sort of half an hour. Oh, oh, minutes. okay. Great. Okay. I w I I won't use all of it in fact, I don't think. Um, okay. So now we can take the demand estimates and use those to calculate own and cross price elasticities. So we just do sort of the transformations and we come up with this um, we come up with this matrix here and let me explain what this is. So uh, on the diagonal of the matrix are the own price elasticity. So, so this number here is the price elasticity of low quality with respect to the price of the low quality. And you can see this, is, I mean, you never, ever get price elasticities <coughs> this high. And we have like this sort of massively price sensitive demand for the low quality products. So this is, I mean, this is, if this were the, the, the end of the story, 
if this was the only product that this firm sold, I would say it's not doing a very good job of escaping the Bertrand paradox. It is facing extremely price sensitive demand and as a result it can charge extremely narrow profits, at least if you sort of <laughs> use this to, to uh, um, uh, calculate a learner index. It, it suggests very, very narrow profits and not enough for this firm to survive. Okay? We know that's not the whole story. Okay? But it is, not, it is sort of nice to have to document that in fact here is a product, it's easily searchable, its price is easily searchable on the internet, and in fact, demand is super, super sensi price sensitive. Okay, so we've got that. Then the other diagonal elements are just the sort of um, price, the, the el price elasticities for the medium and high quality. And you can see that they're also quite elastic. I mean, demand is quite elastic for both the medium and high quality, but significantly less elastic than the low quality. So again, if you were to just use these elasticities to back out and, and the learner index to back out markups, um, the, the, these would imply higher, somewhat higher markups. Still, you know, fairly thin markups, but somewhat higher markups. Okay. But the, so, so the diagonal matrix is pretty interesting, but that's not the interesting part. Okay. Here's the interesting part. Actually, I'll go to the next slide where it's highlighted, I believe. Yes. Okay. So we have a matrix of, of own and cross price elasticities for three super, super similar and easily substitutable products. Okay. What does classic economic theory tell us? It tells us that the, uh, the, the diagonal, which has the own price elasticities, are going to be negative, and the off diagonals are going to be positive. Because these are substitutes. These are like super similar products. I can stick one of them into my computer, or I could take it out and I could stick the other one in the computer, and they're probably going to work almost exactly the same. So it, the sort of a classic economic theory would tell us that these, um, e these off diagonal elasticities should be positive because these are very close substitutes. But that's not what we get here. Okay? So the medium and high quality um, uh, price elasticities are negative with respect to the price of the low quality. So what's going on? Does anyone want to venture an explanation? Stop using. Uh, people, mo people may stop looking for for uh, medium and high uh, high high quality products mm -hmm. if they see that the price of a low product of a low quality product is high. So they see the high price of low, pro yeah, low products. Yeah, yeah. They stop and search for this room. So yes. So I think you're on the right. You're on the right track for sure. I would. I think I would uh, um, sort of. Um, reword it a little bit and say that basically what's going on is that the the when the price of the low quality product goes down um, then the sales of the medium quality product go down as well because the price of the low quality product is being used as an advertisement right does that make sense is that the adverse selection thing you're referring to it's not adverse selection yet could it be? Because um, if the price of the maybe the magnitudes tell us something about adverse selection. Yes. Because I'm thinking of, about the signs. So if the price of the low thing goes down, you check on average where it's guys, and they're less likely to buy mid and high quality products. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So so what your what your your statement is about the relative magnitudes, yes, yes, not yes. about the the um, just the fact that they're negative. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're you're right. So let me yeah. So first, I want to make sure everyone understands why they're negative. But, but you're absolutely right. So basically, they're negative because the low price product, the price of the low quality product is being used as an advertisement. So you lower it, you get more traffic onto your website, and potentially um, more sales of the medium and high quality. However, as Kuhn points out, the kick up in sales of medium and high quality is probably going to be lower than the kick up that you get on the low quality sales. And that's the adverse selection. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
And so the, this is, um, yeah, so I think I've made all the points here. Uh, this is sort of an unusual pattern for cross price elasticities for substitutes, and that's because of the, uh, that's because of the fact that they, uh, that the low, the price of the low quality product is being used as an advertisement for the others. Okay, so a few observations. I probably have gone through most of these already. Um, so we do see evidence, as I said, if, if, if this were just a one product market, then we would see evidence of the Bertrand paradox in like, you know, sort of living color. Um, you know, we never see own price elasticities of negative 25, but we have a pretty precisely estimated own, own price elasticity of negative 25. That's just super high. Um, we do see uh, sort of evidence of this upselling strategy here. I call it a bait and switch or loss leader strategy. Like I said, they're sort of all uh, closely related. And that's because the reduction in rank of the low quality uh, in increases the sales of higher quality. So basically, this, that, the fact that we get these sort of negative um, uh, elasticities off of the uh, diagonal is evidence that this uh, sort of add-on strategy is working. Okay, the low cost, pro the low quality product is being used as an advertisement for the others. Okay, um, we see evidence of search frictions in these results. Uh, the less we see less elastic demand for medium and high quality, and as we noted before. The medium quality and the high quality are, are much harder to search for. There's no category on Price Watch that says, you know, sort of somewhat better than crappy, um, you know, memory modules, or whatever. You just can't search for it or can't search for it easily. And so that comes through in the fact that demand for those medium and high quality products is just less elastic. Uh, the adverse selection problem, where do we see that? Um, we see that in the, in the um, price elasticities, but also the reduction, in, you can see it also in the uh, demand estimates. Uh, if you go back uh, to the demand estimates for a second, um, okay, let's see. The reduction uh, in sales for the medium and the high quality um, when the rank of the low quality product goes up is less than the reduction in the sales for the low quality. That's uh, evidence of the adverse selection. Okay, and then um, I'm not showing all the results that are in the paper, but we do this analysis for several different products and we see the same patterns over and over again in all the products, um, which, you know, I guess is somewhat satisfying or gratifying. Okay, so now I said um, remember on the slide, several slides ago, I said, well, what are we looking for evidence of? And one of the things that we wanted to find evidence of is that this is actually profitable, a profitable strategy for the firm. So in general, this is, you know, it's hard to find evidence that things are profitable strategies for the firms because we don't usually have very good measures of firm profitability. Mm. And we just have to kind of assume because firms are doing it that it's profitable. But here we can have, we can bring to bear some more direct evidence. So remember I told you that we had very detailed data from, uh, from this one firm about in particular all of their sort of co cost of shipping, cost of fulfillment, um, wholesale acquisition cost, et cetera. And so from this very detailed information, uh, we can use these to calculate uh, margins. Um, for all of these different products, and uh, you know, say something about uh, whether this strategy, whether you know, sort of the fact that there's adverse selection in the the um, consumers leads to this being a profitable strategy for the firm, as opposed to just having the firms all compete away the profits for the medium and high quality sales by lowering their low quality price further and further down. Okay, so let's see. So first thing to note is that uh, the markups um, are much higher for medium and high quality products. And the, the low markup, so when we looked at the price elasticities, I said if you, you take the price elasticity for the low quality product, use the learner index to infer a markup, you get a very thin markup. Well, in fact, we ha the, the actual markup is negative. 
Okay? So that's super thin, right? Um, it's, it's not big and negative, it's tiny and negative, but still, it's negative. These, these low quality products are actually being sold at a little tiny bit of a loss. Okay? So that's further evidence these firms could not survive if all they were selling were the low quality products. Okay, the, the, um, the uh, markups that we computed for the mid, uh, the medium quality and the high quality are significantly higher. Okay, not surprisingly, if you think back to the price differentials, I think it was like $25 between the low and the medium. Uh, so here, uh, and the quality difference probably doesn't cost that much. Let's be frank. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, but anyhow, in terms of we we actually know because we have their wholesale acquisition cost, and we know that uh, the the medium the actual medium markup is like seventeen percent, okay, um, and the high markup is even higher. Yep. But you're underestimating cost because one of the things the bid buys you is returns, and returns are costly. Um, yeah. So yes, that you're absolutely right, and um, I. We did have some, some sort of incomplete data on returns, and we, try, we tried to incorporate that. It, did, it wasn't complete, and it didn't seem to make a huge difference. Great, thanks. It didn't seem to make a huge difference, but, but you're right that uh, these could be slightly overstated. Okay? Uh, they're not going to be very different from these. Okay? Um, so what else do we have to say about the, these uh, markups? Uh, so we can compute an overall markup, you know, sort of um, quantity weighted markup based on the markups of the three quality products. And it comes out to 7.7%, which, you know, a pretty lean operating firm can survive on. You know, it can, a firm that's making 7.7%, um, you know, markups can, can do okay if it's not a high cost operation. Okay. And so in particular, not all of the profits are not, yeah, not all the profits have been competed away. Okay, and then we go one step further, and what we say is, let's write down a um, um, naive model that, um, given our estimated elasticities, would uh, sort of just a naive learner index kind of model, what markup would we predict given our estimated elasticities? And we get 4.2%. Uh, which is quite a bit lower than the 7.7% we calculate using the actual cost data, okay? So that, again, is suggestive that adverse selection is, something's going on here and it may be adverse selection, okay? So you can think of the difference between, so this model here that we use to calculate this average, the expected average markup does not take into consideration the adverse selection. It's just a naive model. Okay, then the last thing we did is we wrote down sort of a, a, um, an alternative to the learner index that does in fact incorporate uh, adverse selection. And this gives us a um, predicted uh, markup of 8.3%, which is a somewhat higher than what we actually calculated, but pretty close. Okay, and certainly uh, this markup is closer to what we calculated. The adverse selection markup is closer than the uh, uh, the naive markup. Okay, and then uh, finally, I just want to point out that I guess this is the only time in the talk I'm sort of talking about some of the other products that we looked at, but uh, we see this pattern quite consistently across the other products that the naive markups based on the elasticities are always significant understatements of the markups that we calculate using cost data. Um, and the adverse selection corrected markup is much closer. Okay. So uh, just a couple of comments to finish up and, uh, and then I can take questions. Um, so the, the low quality markups, as I said, are uh, very low, in our case negative. Uh, for that product. Uh, medium and high quality is substantially higher and the overall markups higher than the naive expectation based on the price elasticity. So just restating what, uh, what I had told you earlier. And then finally, uh, let me uh, sort of conclude uh, the presentation um, by sort of driving home a few of the points that I made. So 
We did find evidence that price search can lead to super elastic demand. Uh, and there is a potential for sort of a Bertrand paradox kind of situation where firms are just engaged in this very cutthroat competition. Um, in addition to facilitating price search, um, you know, the internet, however, provides technologies for firms, for instance, to uh, frustrate price search. And we, that's what we saw evidence of in this paper. Uh, we saw evidence that a firm was sort of engaging in this kind of add-on pricing strategy, which was a strategy that had been well known before the internet, but very expensive to implement. The internet comes along, it's much cheaper to implement. And so we've got cheap price search on one hand and cheap uh, obfuscation techniques on the other hand. And how are they going to play out? And we saw at least one example here of how they played out. Um, and the, the, um, you know, we found that add-on pricing is sort of an effective strategy for these firms to uh, raise their profits in equilibrium because of this uh, adverse selection effect. You lower your low quality price too low and you get a bunch of cheap skates on your website and you're not going to make any money. And that sort of is a, a, an effect to keep you from uh, competing away all the profits. Okay, I think that's all I have. Yep. Could you, based on your data, calculate the optimal price for this low quality products to increase the profits? Calculate an optimal price. That's a good question. Um, trying to think about what, what that would involve, whether we would want to do it based on. So, so we can calculate profits at all of the. Um, we can calculate profits at all of the different ranks and price levels and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we probably could do a calculation like that. Yeah. And, and we haven't, but that's a good idea. Um, could I spin your conclusion a little bit differently? You say add-on pricing leads to higher prices through customer mistakes. But my reading of your data says that it supports the naive theory of the Internet, which is to say if you average over all customers, by making a lot more cheapskates happy. The median customer is getting very low pricing that might not otherwise have done so. Yes. And in order to survive, they're increasing price a bit on a small number of people yes. who have been successfully baited and switched. Yep. But in the broad scheme of things, the median customer yes. has more access to the product at the much lower, highly competitive price. I will accept that spin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, maybe I missed this point in the very beginning, but. Uh, do you have the data from where exactly the customer buys, like which website he's coming we only have, So we only have data from one particular website. Yeah, no, I mean, so, um, so if I'm buying their medium quality product, uh, does it mean that I, like, do you know whether I came from searching for the low quality product? Or you maybe I'm an educated... Always, always. I, maybe I shouldn't say always. Customer, I would say, yeah, so, I so maybe I wouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say always, I would say, 99.9% .9 of the customers who end up on these websites have come through by finding the low the price of the low quality product on PriceWatch. So it's not it's not utterly inconceivable that they could have paged down to the seventh or eighth page of the PriceWatch list, seen a medium quality product, but actually there's not enough information on the PriceWatch list for the customers to even know what quality that is. They just know it's a higher price. That's all they know. So the no, chances... If I know the product, so I know exactly what to look for, and I know what the name, for example, I'm kind of changing my search. Uh, yeah, there is a, there actually wasn't really an effective way to do that. Yeah. So these were, these were generic. They were all sort of selling generic memory modules. Um, some of the higher quality products that, were, that they were getting people to upgrade to were quote branded, you know, they were house branded or something, but these were just generic memory modules. So you could, I suppose, type into Google 128 megabyte PC100 memory module 3.0 late CAS latency, you know, aluminum heat sink, blah, 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 you know, but I think that would be a very ineffective way to price search in this market. And I have one more question. Yeah. Since you had like, these other products, 
would it be maybe uh, like 256 megabytes? Like, would it maybe also make sense for the firms maybe to give the add-on? Uh, they do. For, yeah, they do this. As well. Absolutely. Yeah, they do it with all all of the products we looked at. It's not always three quality levels. Some of the products there's only one quality, you know, sort of two quality levels, so one opportunity to upgrade. But we see this in all of the products we looked and at. Also upgrade from 128 to, for example, 256. They could switch the upgrade of the memory. You know. so do, do you want to? Yeah. Sorry. What I meant is actually upgrade from uh, uh, not the quality, but oh. from 128 to 256. Ah. As an experienced user, for me, it would make sense. I like guess the quality that I can actually measure. So I don't know about the so, other So that we don't have data on, whether, whether people go. So we know that there are people who are searching for the 256 on PriceWatch and then go to the website. You know, they'll find the price sorted list on PriceWatch for the 256 megabyte. Um, we don't have data on whether they go to the website looking for 128 and then decide to upgrade. We, n we do know that the websites at this time were not designed for that type of upgrading, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It could have happened, yeah. Just maybe a weird question about, about firms, I mean their actions and their positions in this situation. They all want to uh, be popular, I mean they all want to be in the top on this side. No. No. No, they don't. They don't. No, they don't. That's they don't the key. Know. Because what happens when you're at the top? You Become get popular. all of the cheapskates. All of the really price sensitive. So, so. No, no, it doesn't work this way. No, I mean, no. no. That's a loss leader. That's, that's the worst. <sighs> yeah. Okay, I got it. So, yeah, yeah. I was thinking <laughs> naively that they all want to be in the top. No. <laughs> yeah. Are you trying to? Yeah, exactly. You want to be close enough that people see you, and then some people click through. But if you're if you're the one on the top, you're getting a worse mix of customers. You would like to be on top if it would be a profitable price, but that doesn't happen. So to be on top, you have to be really cheap, so cheap that you actually make a loss, mm -hmm. and you track the customers that even if they click through, but not buy the expensive parts. Yeah. So you want to be a bit down that you get people that want to be cheap but not too cheap. Mm -hmm. If they click through, they actually buy a better product than they clicked on. That's the trick, right? Exactly. It's kind of a really psychological game they're playing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, uh, partly this story reminds me uh, of some kinds of you know cross subsidizing story mm -hmm. when you know we take money from from uh, some, from some rich regions or, or customers and sort of transfer they them in terms of price to poor people. So. I wonder, of course there is self there is a selection, so people decide whether they want low, low yep. or medium module or high module, but uh, can it be, you know, in a way, uh, a positive, uh, a positive, you know, uh, uh, effect on, on an overall welfare? Because the story is a bit similar. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I mean, that's not a calculation we did, but if you, if you sort of made some assumptions about, uh, you know, sort of marginal utility of, of money or something like that, uh, you could definitely get a result where this could be a welfare enhancing uh, kind of strategy. Yeah, because of the re redistributive effect. Any other questions? None of them. Thank you, Sarah. An early lunch break. <laughs>